Today's scripture reading can be found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16, and Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 11 through 14. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16, and Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 11 through 14. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me, when you shall search for me with all your hearts. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. Let us pray. Gracious God Almighty, we thank you for giving us through this week. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your grace, your mercy. Thank you for the sacrifice that your son Jesus Christ did, who shed his blood, who died for us, who offered his life as that sacrifice, the Lamb of God, to take it away all the sins. And Father, when we have failed, when we have sinned, we know that we can always ask for forgiveness. We always know that we can come to you that you would forgive us, and by the blood of Jesus, you will wash us and clean us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we want to lift up unto you, Dignitas Luz V. Minda, give her your comfort, her family as well, over the passing away of her mother. And Father, we pray, Lord, that you just touch her, touch Dignitas Luz, and be with her and all of her family as well. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you're a great, gracious God, a God of comfort, a God of peace. Father, we continue to lift up unto you, Brother Richard, for his complete healing. And by the stripes of Jesus, he is healed. Sister Emilita as well. Brother Kim Chonwa. Brother Choron. Sister Victoria. Sister Pick. David Chonosanim. Esther Samanim, his mother. One me, someone named Father, Sister Rachel's Father, and for Pastor Jesse's complete healing and restoration as well. Father, we pray for peace in Jerusalem, peace on the Korean Peninsula, peace in Nigeria, Kenya, South Sudan, the Republic of the Philippines, and the United States of America. Father, we pray for wisdom and protection for the presidents, their families. Pray for our leadership, Lord, that they would wa rule wisely, make the right decisions. Father, we pray for 100% full-time gainful employment for every member in VCF. For you are the provider. You are Jehovah Jireh. And Father, we pray for 100% faithful service of all the members here in VCF that they would serve faithfully in the ministries. Father, we ask that you touch each marriage. Let Jesus be the third cord in each marriage, Father God. Let there be peace in their marriages, in their families, in this family of God as well, amongst and between brothers and sisters, amongst the brethren. Father, we thank you, Lord God Almighty, for your goodness. We ask and invite the presence of your Holy Spirit to fill our hearts, that we will be receptive to receive all that you have for us. And by the word of God, you shall change us and transform us, renew our minds. And Father, we ask that your angels surround this gathering and protect it against demonic attacks or interferences. Father, let us freely enter into your presence, receive all that you have for us. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace, and your mercy. And we do love you. We give you all the praise, all the glory, 
and all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. I give the Lord a praise clap. For God is good and all the time. And look at someone and say, the, the God of peace touch you. Amen. All right. The Lord Jesus gives you peace. This is part three. So we know Jesus gives us peace. And this peace is by all means. And we see here in Jeremiah 29, 11, that God has thought, thoughts about all of us. And, you know, as a parent, you think about your children, and you're always thinking good thoughts about them, right? You want the best for them. But our Father is perfect. Who is in heaven, he, he is perfect. And his thoughts are never anything evil against you. There are always thoughts of peace. He wants to give you thoughts of uh, uh, an expected end. An expected end means like a uh, hopeful, uh, uh, a thing that you long for uh, of your future. And so when you have someone that is thinking about you, always in your, your best interest, not necessarily the interest that you may have because some, some of our interests may be selfish, but he has the best in store for you. I know as a parent, I always like to think um, the best for my children. And um, sometimes parents, we can be overruling. You know, you make wrong decisions for our children. But um, the, the intent is good, but not necessarily always right. But God will always have good thoughts about you, peaceful thoughts that your end is going to be a, uh, a fruitful ending. And, and, and sometimes we, we don't appreciate that. But God is omniscient, meaning he knows everything. He knows the present, as we sang um, yesterday, today, something, and forever, whatever the song is. God knows your past. He knows your present. And the wonderful thing is he knows your future. So he knows what is best for you and for me. And we always try to take that upon ourselves, that we know what's best for us and our families. And so we want to do that thing. But if you could, if you could take the message this morning and consult God and go to God. Now, people say, I pray to God always, but our prayer is like a monologue. You know what monologue is? One, right? Mono. We should be a dialogue. Dialogue is two. The monologue part is, God, give me this, give me that. I want this, God, please give me that. Thank you. Thank you. And sometimes we throw in a thank you, right? God, I want this, I want that, and I want this. Monologue, one way. Okay, so it's supposed to be one way, Jesus. But our prayer is one way only to him. What about he speaking to us? Oh, what do you mean he speaks to us? Yeah, God is alive. Amen? Look at somebody and touch somebody and say, Jesus is alive. He's alive. You know, we sing that. But we don't believe that God is alive. And you know what? God speaks to us. He spoke to the people in the Old Testament, and he speaks to people, he spoke to people in the New Testament, and he speaks to us right now. As children of God, you can find out what he has in store for you, what is the best way to go. There are so many ways, so many choices in this world, right? So many different colors and flavors and everything else. You go to Baskin and Robbins, they got 31 flavors. But you know what I learned? They don't really have 31 flavors at that time. They may have 31 flavors in the, 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 the warehouse, but they don't have 31 favor, flavors at that uh, store that you go to. So just, just a side thought. Nothing wrong with Baskin and Robbins, but just don't believe everything that you hear, okay? So... Um, so many choices we have. And, and, and we make so many choices. Well, I've got to learn by experience. Do you need to touch the fire to learn that the fire is hot? No, of course not, right? Oh, but I've got to learn by experience. People, we need to understand 
that God knows precisely what is best for us. And that's why he, he, uh, Jeremiah was saying, seek and, then you, and seek, and then you shall find me. Ask, and you shall receive. Knock, and the door shall be opened. We need people, men and women of God, that are going to go to the Lord first. The first, time, the first thing we do is go to ourselves, and the, the people with these complexes, they go to other people first. Why don't you go to God first? So before I, I, I look for advice, every morning I will go into the Word and seek Him. What is your advice for me? Now, that is not to say that God doesn't speak through people. He spoke through Jeremiah, who was a person. He spoke through Ezekiel. He spoke through Isaiah. He can speak through men and women of God to speak to you. But find out where your secret, your, your, your closet is, your prayer closet. Now, in a prayer closet, everybody thinks it has to be in with the, uh, the, the coats, the winter clothing. Well, soon you'll be taking things out. out but say the, 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 the closet with all the summer clothing, because you're probably not going to be going into summer clothing now. You're going to be transitioning to the winter clothes, amen? Getting pretty little cooler here. So you go into your cl Everybody thinks you've got to go in a closet where there is a, the mothballs and all that kind of stuff and pray. That, that is... That's a technique, okay, for going into your prayer closet. But the prayer closet is where you can best hear God. Best hear God, okay? And he speaks to us right now. If you would only understand that he can speak to you now, as he spoke to the people in the past, you would eliminate many I mean, of the mistakes and the, the wrong path that you went. A lot of people will be presumptuous. And they, they go according to their conscience. And they say, oh, God spoke to me. I don't doubt that you heard a voice. You heard a voice. But it may not have been God. Okay? You know, the person that says, well, God told me I need to leave Korea. And I need to uh, start and open up a retreat center. Because God told me. Okay, so I'm. I'm not God. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna argue with you. If you said God spoke to you, then okay. Well, not that I believe you, but maybe God did speak to you. So the person goes out, spends about two years trying to open up a retreat center, and then he can't even get his staff, faculty. He can't even uh, find the place and all that, and he's he's struggling to make God's will happen. If you understand. So struggle, 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 and then after two years, returns back to Korea and says, um, well, God wanted to teach me how to prepare to make one. You spent all that money, spent all that time, you wasted two years in something fruitless, right? Because you said God, and in your pride, God told me. Hmm, okay, well, whatever, you know, that's your, you will know them by their fruit, so if there's no fruit, then probably God didn't tell him because God is not a God that's going to cause you to set you up to fail. He doesn't set you up so that you can fail and learn a lesson. You don't need to be learning lessons. You just need to obey God, hear his voice, and then obey him and then move out. And so we see here that sometimes in life, we're going to go through difficulties. And I don't know about you, but I have my share of going through difficulties, okay? And a lot of that time, I would say, is because of my arrogance and my uh, stubbornness. And I said, this is the way to go and all that. And it went and boom, you hit the wall and come back and try to <laughs> start again and, and make it happen. If I had only consulted God before, I could have saved myself that that um, that experience, okay, and I got a lot of experiences of doing, of not doing the right thing, of not following God, okay. You don't want to hear that. You want to hear the things about how I heard God, and then obeyed Him, and then things worked out because He has thoughts of peace, so that I can get an expected end. 
If I had known what I know now, my life would have been so much, not that I would not have any problems, but it would be so much more delightful, okay? And um, just because you're struggling in life, that doesn't mean you're following, you're, you're, a, you're a man or woman of God and you're doing a wonderful thing. No, you could be just wrong, just totally wrong. And you, and, and you just missed the boat. You, you missed whatever God told you. You're on another boat. You, you, you're sailing someplace along. Uh, you probably don't know where you're sailing, but you think you know where you're at. But now maybe it's time to repent, to confess, say, God, I'm sorry. I was arrogant, and um, I did it my way. You know, you got to be careful about the songs that you sing, right? Because that can, that can cause you a lot of heartache and, 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 and travail and gnashing of teeth, okay? But as believers, we can experience great, wonderful things that God can show us. The Apostle Paul is going through an experience here. And in Acts 27, 22, let me read this, and I'll, I'll give you more background and then um, relate this story to the message. Now I, and that's Paul, I put that in, exhort you to be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angels of God, the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God had given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. So Paul, as you know, was in Jerusalem. And the people were trying to um, frame him up. They were falsely accusing him, saying all these things, and, and um, saying he, he did this and all that, so he deserved to be uh, jailed. He deserved to be killed, to be uh, ex executed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then Paul, for some reason, just out of nowhere says, as a Roman citizen, right, he says, I appeal unto Caesar. Enough of this stuff. I appeal unto Caesar. So the, the governor, whoever of that, um, that jurisdiction says, you want to go to Caesar? Then to Caesar you're going to go. So Paul now is like a quote-unquote prisoner. He didn't do anything wrong, but because he appealed to Caesar, which was probably the, that modern-day uh, Roman Supreme Court, then he was amongst other prisoners, and they were sailing en route to, um, to, um, to Rome, to Italy. And so they left Jerusalem, and they're on a, on a ship, and then they go to a place, they stop, and then what happens is um, they have to wait till another ship comes. This is not like when you say, hey, I'm going to uh, plan a trip to wherever, and then you get connecting flights and all that kind of stuff. This is, they, they wait till there's another available ship. So there's a ship that comes into port at the first destination. And then Paul says, you know, I perceive that this, this is going to be a um, dangerous journey. So maybe we shouldn't take this one because, you know, maybe it was a season when there were cyclones or typhoons or hurricanes or whatever you call them at that time. And they said, no, no, we're going to go ahead. Uh, we're just going to go ahead. So, so they went, and sure enough, there's a, a huge cyclone, and it's um, causing them, causing the ship to, um, to uh, flood, and um, they got to throw the goods abroad. And, and anyway, they're about to, to, to fear for their life. They think they're all going to die. For a long period of time, they, they're not eating, and it's just this, this storm continues on. And they're all afraid of dying. And then this angel of God is going to appear unto Paul. And the angel of God is, says, is saying to Paul, you're going to go, you're going to make it to, to, to see Caesar. You're going to go to Italy, to Rome, um, even though the situation is like this. And on top of that, no one in the boat is going to die, and the ship is going to die as well. 
They're still experiencing the storm, experiencing a difficult time. But Paul says, you know what, the angel of God, God has this plan for me. And this plan is that I'm going to go to, to meet Caesar. No matter what the current situation was, I'm going to make it. We're all going to make it safely because God, through his angel, is telling me I'm going to make it. So sometimes we need an appearance from God by his angel to tell us no matter what, uh, in spite of what we are going through in this life because we can't see beyond that because we're only worried about the current situation. But Paul was able to say, you know what, I'm trusting in God that God is going to take me to Caesar. So now, God didn't say in the same ship or or et cetera, or what, or something supernatural is going to happen where uh, the angel is going to take the ship and then take it to Italy. He didn't say that. He said, you're just going to make it. So when God speaks to you, we as believers, this is the faith. This is where faith has to be activated. We don't see in the natural what is beyond. But with our spiritual eyes, we can see that the end that God has for us. But if your focus is only on the natural, on the current, it's hard to see beyond. It's hard to see beyond there. But Paul fixated his spiritual eyes and was looking at I'm going to go and see Caesar. And Caesar maybe was in Rome where the court was held. I'm going to make it. Okay, whatever happens is going to happen, but I'm still going to make it to see Caesar because God, through his angel, told me I was going to make it. So when you get this, this faith now, that's the part where we have to receive what God has spoken to us, and then you hang on to it, and you're going to make it. It's a wonderful thing to, to be able to know kind of like, sort of like what your future is going to be. Now, you don't know exactly all these curves and these turns and all that, that what's going to happen. Or, um, and the devil might try to do even worse things to you. Uh, but, but you're going to make it because you have that faith and, and may his kingdom come and will be done in your life. The problem is that we are so stuck in the current, in the current situation, that we can't get our head out of what's going on. So we just like can't even look beyond tomorrow in one way. How can you look at down the road where God has this purpose for you if you only focus on the now? In Mark 4:18. Jesus says, and these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. So many Christians, the world is worried. People are worried. Unbelievers are worried about what's going on in the current. But even believers, what I've discovered, are so overly concerned about their current situation. What it does is it chokes the word. We're not able to have faith now in the word because whatever word you hear, you just squeeze it out because of the cares and the concerns and the worries that every day brings. So if you focus on now and overly focus or overly concern, how are you going to be looking at my faith and what God has for you in your future? Can't get there. That's why I believe so many people living fruit, fruitless lives, Christian lives, no, 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 no faith because we're so concerned about the things of this world. Jesus says, 
But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We can, we can recite that, memorize that, and you get a candy because you memorize that verse. But how many of you live it? How many of you live that where I'm going to trust in the Lord? God has given me some visions. They have not come to pass yet. But you know what? I'm looking at it and saying, they're going to come to pass because he gave me this. And I'm going to trust in him, and it's going to come to pass. Did it come to pass? And some of these were like 20 years ago that he gave me. Okay? So, all right. They didn't happen 20 years ago, these years. But a day is a thousand years to the Lord. A thousand years is a day to him. So 20 years is like not even a day, right? Because, you know, a thousand years, right? You figure out the math. Some of you are mathematicians, right? One day to the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. So it might be a couple of seconds. Twenty years might be a couple of seconds. But he's giving me these visions. And I know they came from him. And they're not fulfilled yet. But you know what? I have the faith that they're going to be fulfilled. And some things he give me, gives me, and it might be that, that particular day. Okay, we all like that where it happens that day. And, oh, yeah, I heard from God. But sometimes God is saying, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust, I trust you, but I'm going to give you something that is maybe somewhere down the line. Down, you know, in our terms, maybe somewhere in the far future or something like that. Okay, but... If I'm too concerned about what's going on today and overly concerned, then th there's no way I can, I can come out of this, 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 this web of all these like uh, uh, vines and, and, and all that. We need to get above that, spiritual people. Walk by faith. See that God has this plan, this, these thoughts a plan that you get of peace and an expected end. That way you will never despair. Also, Christians are not to be overly concerned about our future. And I'm, I'm talking about overly concerned is worrying about our future. Okay, we're, we're like in a mess. We're struggling in the current and then so worried about our future. And one of, one of the things I, I, I've seen is if people have had a um, um, hard back uh, um, um, upbringing when they grew up, they, they, they now live in fear. People live in fear. And they, they fear about their future. There's a fear a scary feeling about the future. In James 4.13, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that, that appeared for a little time and then vanished away. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. We don't even know what really tomorrow is going to be in store for us. We don't, we don't know. We don't know. I'd like to always believe that, okay, in the morning, the sun, well, wake up early. I like to wake up and then um, get my, make my coffee and then my oatmeal and get ready, right? And everything working. Everything works the way it's been working for the last 10, 15, 20 years. I like routine. Everybody likes routine, right? I don't like to be, uh, I don't like anything out of routine. And so we all like to say, okay, these things here, and then maybe um, go to work, turn, turn the ignition in the car, and the car should work, right? 
know, the battery and everything should work. All these things, we, we expect that to happen. But what, what, what James is writing here, he says, we don't even know what tomorrow will bring. So we don't know that all these things are going to happen. Some people are not going to wake up tomorrow morning. Some people are not going to, like, be um, as business as usual. That's why one thing we should be thankful every single day that God has given us each day. And first thing, boom, when you, when you wake up into consciousness, you say, thank you, God, for this day, because you woke up. Amen? Now, we don't know what is going to happen throughout the rest of the day. We like things to work out the way it's been always working out, and, and we like this routine. But James is saying, we don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. But people are so worried about tomorrow, so worried about their future. Why, why do you worry about your future? If you walk with the Lord, and you can only walk with the Lord one uh, today, you understand? Yesterday is finished already. Done. Today, because tomorrow you're not guaranteed. But today you can walk with the Lord. Amen? And that's what you have is today. So why are you so worried about the future? What? The future may not even come for you. We're so worried. And some people have these... Um, I remember worrying. I used to be a warrior in the, not warrior, warrior. So if you look at a dictionary on the worry, you would see my face because I like to worry. And I had once somebody say, if you do this, you keep, if you keep worrying like this. The guy had, had white hair, nothing wrong with white hair, okay, but the guy had black hair and it turned white. He said, your hair's going to be like this. Okay. That was one of my, uh, my, my main um, right arm guys that um, supported me. Anyway, so I know I used to worry a lot. And we worry. Look at somebody and just smile at them. Okay, you see a face of worry? Of course not, right? They're all believers, amen? So don't worry about what all these things. And, and the, the problem is our worry is normally... A bad kind of worry, what I mean. We're always thinking negative, negative kind of thinking. That's the nature. It's this negative thinking about the future. But if God has spoken to you, his thoughts about you, his plan for you are is a plan of peace that you can have an expected end. Just as Paul knew that no matter what he went through on this ship, and they did get shipwrecked. They did have to swim or float in onto another island until they could get another boat or ship and then onward to, to Italy. It wasn't all that, um, that simple where the, the, the storm stopped and all that. No. They, they, they went through a, a different route. But, but Paul knew that it was going to be an expected end. God has an expected end. He has a plan for you. So what do we need to do? One, for the present here. Instead of worrying and being concerned about the present, in, in Isaiah 30, 21, And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. What does this mean? What it means is that be someone that is going to seek the Lord's direction, okay? Even to the point of going right or going left. Because maybe in the past, we went left when God says go right, but we didn't listen to God. So we went left, and we found out that was not a good way to go. But if you had gone right then it would have been worked out better, okay? So God is the God of now. He's in the present. He will speak to you about things even right now. Amen? Okay, don't be insecure like, oh, 
Some people are always asking, oh, oh can you help me? Can, can you, what, do I do? what do I do? You can hear God as well as I can hear God, amen? Yes? So why, why are you always asking people for advice? Go to the Lord. And his word is living, is alive, is now. God is the God of now. And then for your future, for your future, right? Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God for your future to get on the right track what, what we need to do is to say and I remember saying this uh, over 20 years ago God I tried it my way and I failed and I'm sorry and I repent and now I turn my life over to you Offer your lives as a living sacrifice. Okay, there's two kinds of sacrifice. A dead sacrifice and a, a live sacrifice, living sacrifice. I'm talking about being a living sacrifice, okay? So we don't all have to go and go get martyred right now. That's But we are martyrs because we should be dead to ourselves. So be that living sacrifice. Say, God, I offer my life to you. I offer my life to you and... Lead me and direct me in, in, in the way that you want me to go. Hey, wait a minute. Some of you guys are saying, I got a career. I went to school. And I got this, all this education. And I'm an expert in my field. But you know what? Maybe you did it out of your own self, selfish reasons, and you never heard God. And you never follow God. It is possible that when we come at the end and have judgment day, that we're going to meet God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to talk about all the great, wonderful accomplishments that we did. And he's going to say, he's going to say, I never told you to do that. But Oh, see all these great things, these wonderful uh, accomplishments, all these things. I never told you to do that. It's better to be in God's perf perfect will. And maybe in, in the eyes of the world, you're not a great one and, and, and popular and whatever person. It's, it's best to be in his perfect will. You know, I look at John the Baptist. I believe he was in God's perfect will. Anybody willing to say he wasn't? He was. John the Baptist spent his life out there in the wilderness somewhere, right? Eating, uh, they said locusts and honey or something like that, right? But, okay, so he's living a Nazarene kind of life. Probably, he probably didn't go to Itaewon, throw him down, have a great time out there. Okay, he, wasn't, he probably didn't, wasn't one of those guys, all right? So he's out there <laughs> munching on locusts <laughs> and, and honey, right? Okay, I guess locusts can be okay um, if you put some honey on it, right? And I remember eating something called bundegi, bundegi, silkworms or something like that felt like I, I was eating cockroach. And I was thinking, I guess it got a lot of protein. And, and anyway, these guys are big guys, big silkworms, okay? So I don't know, but if I put honey on it, it might have been better. I don't know, you know, but anyway, so I'm thinking about John the Baptist. He's out there sacrificing his life, and then God says, okay, come out now. And then you're going to be the one that's going to lay the, 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 the path for the, and bring back people to God, right? So he's telling everybody, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He's repenting, right? 
the, the scholars believe, and you know what happens to John? He baptizes a lot, and then later on, he gets arrested. You know what his reward was for um, challenging all the Pharisees and all the Sadducees and all that? He gets to get in prison, right? And you know what? On top of that, they chopped off his head. So from the time that John the Baptist began his, quote, unquote, ministry, to the time that he was executed was about six months. That's what, that's what these scholars believe. He spent 30 years or something like that out there in the wilderness eating locusts and honey, <laughs> and he has six months of ministry. And it ends by being in prison and having his head chopped off. What kind of great kind of reward is that, right? And then you get other people like the Apostle John. Some people believe he, he lived to over 100 years. He's in uh, the island of Patmos, and he's um, out there exiled and um, whatever. And then he gets his revelation, and, and ergo the, uh, the book of Re Revelation as he's out there. But he gets to live to hundred something years old so you know you get that the, the different um, end but all of them were able to achieve this expected end they did what God wanted them to do right and that is what our our um, desire should be we should our desire should be to fulfill God's perfect will in our lives but we have to offer our lives first unto him. We have to be willing to say, God, you can mess it all up and just destroy everything and start all over again. I'm willing to start all over again. And it's hard. You know, when you're mid, um, uh, what's the word? Not midlife crisis, but in midlife, to start anew, it's really hard. You like to start, you know, you go to college and all that and then find a job that you're going to work for the next 40 years. And that, that's a great, perfect scenario. But in mid-life, when, when God has to break and mess everything up in your life so that you can start anew in his way, the great thing about that, don't think about the time you lost and wasted, but think of it that now you get to do his will. His good, acceptable, perfect will. So when, when God speaks to you, go find that prayer closet, the place that you can, can hear from God, then you will be able to know that even though you're going through a crisis in your life, that he's going to get you there. He will enable you. You're going to be able to fulfill that. And then on top of that, when you meet him, when it's all over, whether your ministry is John the Baptist ministry or the Apostle John, he's going to say, well done and good, for, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And all of us can have that opportunity. So where, wherever we're at, we can stop. We can and be humble and say, God, I'm willing to start all over again if that's what it is. But if God doesn't say it, don't just mess it all up, okay? Don't, don't break the Legos and then start again. Unless God tells you to do that. And when he does that, then may his kingdom come and will be done in your life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have thoughts of peace for us. That we will be able to have an expected end that we'll be able to fulfill the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Father, I thank you, Lord, for each one here. You are a living God. God, speak to each one of your children, Lord. They can go straight and directly to you and seek your guidance. Ask, seek, and knock. They shall receive, they shall find, and a door shall be opened unto them. Father, may they live a life in peace at the present and live a life of peace 
in the future as well. And Father, thank you, Lord. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.